Good afternoon, everybody. The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focused webinar series. Topics in the series will include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development like today's session. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for any future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. And please see our website for more details. So my name is Sheila Graham, and I'm Professor of Molecular Virology at the University of Glasgow, and I'm Chair of the Biochemical Society. And it's my pleasure to chair this session today. Today's webinar is entitled Raising Your Professional Profile, and it's part of our dedicated research, early research career, research, sorry, early career research program of webinars focused on career support and guidance. There are many ways to raise your professional profile, and during this session, we'll, we'll discuss some of these. And these include ideas for creating network opportunities, such as presenting work at conferences and other events, which might in turn generate collaborative opportunities for you. We'll think about how you can get involved in organizing events within your field to gain recognition, which can be important for moving on in your career. And we'll look at seeking opportunities for mentoring and for work experience schemes and finding alternative routes and career paths, such as industry, communications, editor, editorial work, and so on. So today we have invited three panelists who work in different roles and different sectors, who will share their, their experiences and provide advice on how to raise your professional profile. So we have Dr. Robbie Baldock, who's Senior Lecturer in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Gloucestershire. We have Dr. Helen Watson, who's an Associate Professor of Bioscience Education in the Schools of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Plymouth. And Dr. Parag Achra, sorry, I've said your name wrong, Parag. Acharya, Senior Fellow in Food Innovation at the National Resources Institute, University of Greenwich. So each speaker will deliver a short presentation of about five minutes, which focuses on their career path and their experience. And the session will provide attendees with the opportunity to gain an insight about different ways that can help you raise your professional profile. And you'll be able to ask questions directly to the panel. Now, remember that the questions will be asked after each of the panel members have given their presentations, but please do send your questions in during the talk. If you have a question, please type it in the question box, as shown um, in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, and we'll try to answer as many questions as you can in the time we have allowed. So that's the introduction, and I'd like now to introduce Robbie, who's uh, going to give you his presentation. Robbie completed his PhD at the University of Sussex, investigating mechanisms of DNA repair before continuing on this theme at the University of Pittsburgh as a postdoctoral associate. 2018, he joined Solent University of Southampton as a lecturer. And last year, he was awarded funding from the Royal Society to investigate how the integrity of the mitochondrial genome was maintained. Robbie currently serves in the Biochemical Society's Research Area Committee for Genes and has recently joined the University of Gloucestershire as a senior lecturer to develop a new biomedical science degree, which I'm sure he's finding very exciting. He's also part of the Early Career Research Task Force for the Society's publishers, publisher Portland Press. Thank you very much, Robbie, and if you can continue with your presentation. Thank you very much. Just to confirm, you can see my presentation at the moment. Yes, we can see your presentation. Brilliant. So thank you very much for inviting me to um, speak about my own experiences of, um, oops, sorry, I don't know if my screen has gone there. Okay. Let's try that again. Sorry. About um, speaking about my own experiences in terms of raising my professional profile and hopefully I'll be able to offer some advice um, for others potentially on activities that you can undertake or opportunities to look out for. So um, I won't let sort of go through this in too much detail. Uh, thankfully, Sheila gave a really comprehensive introduction. I started my um, career off um, doing my undergrad at the University of Sussex, um, studying molecular medicine. Uh, and I've 
my third year project was actually on investigating fruit flies and, and their developmental processes. And so I sort of continued along the sort of research track, uh, did my PhD at the University of Sussex. Uh, I spent a couple of years at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and you can see over here the Cathedral of Learning in, um, in Pittsburgh, fantastic city um, to, to live. And then more recently joined Solent University to develop a new program and now essentially doing the same at the University of Gloucestershire. So, so lots of exciting times ahead. So in terms of some of the, the points that Sheila uh, initially introduced, um, I wanted to sort of cover uh, essentially uh, sort of four points. So first of which is creating opportunities for networking. And from my own experience, actually Twitter has been a fantastic tool uh, to be able to do this. Um, first of all, it has this fantastic scientific community um, that are very active and engaged, and they're overwhelmingly supportive. Uh, if I could offer one piece of advice, if it's something that you're not currently using, definitely get on Twitter and start engaging with that community. Um, it also gives a, a great opportunity to, to create discussions. And as you'll see uh, in a moment, it's, um, it gives you the freedom to essentially network with, with people with shared interests, you know, whether that's a very niche area of your scientific field, but it, it kind of breaks down barriers that you might have uh, through sort of geographical location. Uh, which is the kind of way things are moving forward and have, have sort of been forced in the last year. The other thing to mention is there are other platforms that you can use, um, such as LinkedIn. It's just to be aware about who the audience are for those particular platforms. Um, so, for example, with LinkedIn, you, it's a little bit more formal. Uh, it's for your sort of qualifications, certifications, uh, your career history. And I would say the audience that you will find on LinkedIn are probably more industry focused uh, rather than sort of uh, a kind of academia. And of course, um, it's really important to consider the society events as well. They're, they're basically have a look at what the societies are doing and you'll find all sorts of opportunities there to get involved. And so some of the things that I've been involved in uh, in the last year, again, is some of the events are the biochemistry focused webinar series that you're actually attending currently. The really nice thing about this is it gives you the opportunity to tell us what you want from the society. If you want to learn more about uh, careers outside of academia or how to, to write grants from, from the people who've done it, then it's the perfect opportunity. Uh, you can simply actually submit a proposal for a new event just using their online form, and it's a really short form. Um, so with that in mind, I actually got the opportunity to chair one of these webinar um, series recently and it was on the careers in science communication, medical writing and engagement. And it was a really uh, insightful opportunity to hear from people who are currently working in those fields. And as I'm sure Sheila will attest to, when you're dealing with questions, it's a bit like um, spinning plates live on the internet. Other things that I've had the opportunity to be involved with, again, Twitter chats um, that were sort of later documented in a, a biochemist blog. Uh, these are a great opportunity. It doesn't have to be organized through um, through a society. If, if it's a sort of an area that you're interested in and there are other people who want to get, engage in that discussion, go right ahead and, and, and try to promote it on, on Twitter. You know, there's plenty of opportunity there. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, there, there are some other things that you can do in terms of um, volunteering and different experiences. I, I got the opportunity to serve on the EC, uh, early Career Research and Publishing Task Force for Portland Press. And this has been a really unique opportunity to have, a, a, have our say essentially on things like publication routes, which we think are uh, sort of the most appropriate, how we should be using preprints and the limitations of those, um, different models for peer review, and also what are, what are the important um, considerations when, we, when you sort of consider which journal to submit your research to. And I'm really excited to see how Portland Press actually take this information forwards um, and actually develop it in their sort of policies and protocols. Last thing to say is there is plenty of other opportunities sort of outside of necessarily the, the societies. There are groups uh, with shared interests. So uh, as a lecturer, the sort of uh, Dry Labs Real Science project has been fantastic, a uh, fantastic opportunity. Uh, and all of the, the content from that is actually hosted on lecture remotely. But I actually uh, used it as an opportunity to kind of showcase some of the, the, the teaching work where we're actually using augmented reality uh, to teach structural biology, which was a really cool project to do. So I'm glad I've had the opportunity to do that. 
ultimately, if I was to sort of give a, a sort of a, a set of advice um, to to other people who are interested in getting involved, firstly, get on Twitter. I think it's a it's a real opportunity just for you to find out what's going on, first of all, but also uh, then to look at what's going on with the societies. And there are plenty of opportunities either for you to propose your own events or to get involved, and they can give you that sort of platform to kind of uh, level up and get engaged with more people. Um, thirdly, I would say, you know, uh, from the outset, try and support each other. I think that's something that's that's very appealing is when you have an environment that celebrates the successes, but also, you know, shares in the in the challenges and difficulties, um, particularly, you know, in academia and, and grant funding and how people deal with, um, you know, su success and rejections. Um, but obviously, if you can, you know, organize an event and a meeting and it can be really small. It could just be a couple of people who have a shared interest. The other thing I would say is look beyond publications. I mean, publications are sort of the primary currency of everything that we do in academia. But there are opportunities to uh, make contributions beyond that. So uh, one example I was thinking of is um, I've done a lot of a lot of coding in the last year because of the limited access to labs. And it's a very, very uh, useful thing to be able to publish and share that code with, with other people. So I've actually published some code that other people can use to run, for example, web scraping projects. Um, you know, all of these add value to the community. It's, it's about the sort of technical expertise, but it's not necessarily strict peer reviewed publication. And last of all, have fun. That's the most important part. And so with that, um, I'd like to hand back to Sheila. Robin, that was very insightful. Some really important points there that I'm sure we'll address a little bit later on. So we're going to move on now to our second speaker. And our second speaker is Dr. Helen Watson, um, who's Associate Professor of Bioscience Education in the Schools of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Plymouth. And Helen is an education-focused academic, and she has a, a strong interest in bioscience and skills education. She chairs the School of Medicine Dentistry and Biomedical Science Athena Swan self-assessment team and co-chairs the university self-assessment team. She's a strong interest in widening participation in higher education and she's the co-lead for this for the medical school. She has had a long-standing involvement with Biochemical Society where she chairs currently the Education and Training and Public Engagement Committee. So thanks very much Helen, it's over to you. Thanks Sheila, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Ideal, thanks. Um, okay, so yeah, Sheila said um, a bit about my background. So I, I've kind of divided this presentation into two, uh, just two slides, and um, I'm going to look at kind of what I do in my day job and then sort of extra stuff if you like. Um, so yeah, I studied BSc and PhD at the University of Southampton in biochemistry, and I went up to the University of Manchester and did some postdoc research on protein folding and trafficking up there. Uh, then I missed the South Coast, so I came back um, and I was appointed as a, an education-focused lecturer at the University of Plymouth and Exeter, which at that time shared a medical school. Um, so that was a kind of conscious decision to move into the, the education side. Um, and then two years ago, I was a, a appointed Associate Professor in Bioscience Education in Plymouth, where I work across uh, the medical school and the dental school. So that's kind of uh, the basic path I've taken. And then I guess in parallel, I've, I've been quite um, proactive in developing external roles. And, and for me, my focus, uh, as Sheila already kind of alluded to there, is, is a focus on education, outreach and widening participation, equality, diversity, inclusion, and transferable skills education. So, I guess in parallel to those those roles I just flushed up in the previous slide, um, I've got quite a few roles and have had in the past at the Biochemical Society, which have been really important for me, something I've really enjoyed, but also have really contributed to helping me progress and raise my profile. So at the moment, I chair the Education Committee. Um, I helped set up the training theme panel when that first started up and kind of get the society's training activity uh, up and running. I've also been involved in things like grants committees and conferences committees, and, and it's all kind of useful experience like um, judging grant applications and, and kind of external reviewing and all those kinds of things that are helpful experiences to have. Um, I think Robbie's already kind of noted how helpful it is to organise conferences and events. So I've organised several conferences and events with Biochem SOC. 
Um, we've had a few collaborations with other societies as well, which has been really good. Uh, and also with the Medical Schools Council on things like um, widening participation for medical students. Um, and then I think it's really important to kind of continue this stuff internally as well. So I've done similar things within the University of Plymouth. So me and a couple of colleagues run an education scholarship event twice a year, which is it's a low key thing and we don't have huge numbers of attendees, but it kind of keeps that ticking over nicely and it, and it makes sure you know that my profile internally as well is, is kind of maintained. Um, and then a couple of other things nationally like um, like uh, education outreach, science outreach, um, sort of using my role in the University of Plymouth as a bit of a springboard for that. Um, and also nationally, I've been involved a lot with the advanced AHE panels looking at Dina Swan Awards and things, and I'm involved in that new process now, which again gives me kind of a, another string to my bow, but also uh, allows me to network with, with people in that area too. Um, so I guess in terms of like, tips and things um i guess always be outward looking um, it's very easy because we have so much work to do to get very bogged down with day-to-day -day running of what we're doing so where possible keep looking outwards keep looking for opportunities and things you can use to develop your profile you can use internal roles as a springboard so if you take on a lead role within your job your day job if you like um you can then use that as a way to get experience to then branch out and do something in a similar field but externally network as much as you can networking is like a quite an off-putting word but just like meet people and then talk to them again talk to them afterwards follow up with them um, like Robbie said things like Twitter are really good for that um, if you organize an event with someone email them six months later and follow up with something or you know just just keep those networks going um, be collaborative there's there's too much uh, there's in, in academia there's a temptation to kind of keep all your work to yourself but it really doesn't work collaboration is definitely the way forward and sharing um, find what your areas of interest are and build on them so don't take on external roles in things you don't really care about because you're just giving yourself extra work that isn't very fun so really build them um, and remember that your skills and knowledge are immensely transferable so although you may study as a postdoc a very small, tiny area of science, your skills and knowledge are applicable way, way beyond that. Um, so yeah, look for ways in. For me, being an organiser of conferences has made me more visible. So it can be a bit intimidating, but it means everyone's sort of looking at you, but in a good way. Um, and one thing then leads to another. So you organise one thing, you get asked to organise another thing. Someone you organised it with asks you to join in with something else and so on. Um, like I said, maintaining communities can be really good. So for me, the education com community from Biochemical Society and FEBS, which is the European Biochemical Societies, has been massively supportive. Um, and, and yeah, like Robbie said, like use these things, like these extra things to just enjoy what you do create a space where you can sort of enjoy these extra activities and that will make you feel more enthusiastic and, and more motivated to take on stuff like this. Okay, thanks, that's all I've got. I'll hand back to Sheila now. Well, I think some really key points there, but hopefully we'll go back to the end of the webinar. So now I'm going to invite our final speaker, Parag. Um, so Parag, is a senior fellow in Food Innovation at the Nash, Nash, Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich, and he's had a really interesting career. Um, he joined the University of Greenwich after 14 years of industrial R&D career in food biotechnology center, sectors across North America and Europe, and he has a very successful track record of R&D-led product innovations. Over the last 10 years, he's been working for Unilever Food Research and Development based in the Netherlands, and has been able to deliver clean label food products and sustainable process technologies. Parag was involved in the Biochemical Society's Industry Advisory Panel, and hopefully he's going to give us some insights on career transition between academic, uh, academia and industry. So Parag, over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Shella, and uh, thank you Biochemical Society for, uh, for arranging this uh, meeting. 
Um, so, uh, as Shayla said, I mean, uh, of course, uh, I, I'm going to give a little bit of insights of what I gained over my career transition uh, from uh, academia to industry and back to academia. Um, so, with a brief that already uh, Shayla talked about, so my background and experience, um, I just recently uh, left Unilever, being almost ten, nine nine and a half years in science and tech as science and technology manager, um, working on product research innovation by unlocking science. Previous, I have working experience in small, medium sized enterprise startups um, with a background of PhD and postdoctoral research. So as you see, like, I mean, I have not only moved my job through the career transition, but also stays in different countries, in different cultures, which has enriched my own uh, perspectives and insights. In my current role in, in uh, Natural Resources Institute, I'm leading the climate smart food technologies and innovation, also supporting the enterprise activities. As you know, that much of many of these UK universities, I would say more, all of the UK universities are slowly transitioning into um, more in industry partnerships and, and areas of application and applied research. Uh, one of my interest point is work, uh, I mean, is about the plant-based food so plant protein based food and algae. Also, I'm leading the Medway Food Innovation Center. Uh, it's actually a brand new innovation center that is coming up and that's actually intrigued my interest to uh, leave the industrial research setting and join here uh, to leave that, that whole uh, activities. Now, uh, let's start with the fact that the world we are in, you know, we all are. So it's one of the facts is that it's ever changing. It's uh, continuously evolving. There are some trends coming up. There are some trends which were actually sort of like, you know, going away. There are demands for new skills and technologies. And there's a requirement that you need to sort of de-skill and reskill over the time of your career. Yeah. And another aspect which is ever important is about the growth mindset. Yeah, so with that, I think there were one experience that we all are having positive uh, in, a, well, in a negative way is about the COVID. That actually it has impacted all of our life, the career, uh, you know, the work. However, if you look this as a little bit of in a positive dimension, you will also see this has changed some of the established dogmas and dynamics and brought up some, some new insights and new ways of looking things. For example, you know, the Zoom uh, uh, teams or there was another um, software like Miro, which has given, which has broadened our scope of collaboration, networking, even sitting in home, you know, without having travel, spending time on travels, and etc. These are, so in that way, it has opened up new opportunities. So I would say that why not grab that opportunity rather than sort of, you know, thinking about what is the past, what we have done or what we, we were doing even a few years back uh, and trying to see the future as it's changing and embrace it. Now, in terms of raising a professional profile, what I have learned over these years. So, of course, uh, the, the, the setting in, in the industry and the academia is a bit different. So, in industry, the goal is always immediate. Yeah. So, how you apply, the, even if in terms of science and technology, how you apply that with solving some kind of problems yeah, that industry is facing. Uh, now, in academia, it's more about exploring the unknown, the science, the, the technology behind that. Now, what I would say that first and foremost thing is about aspiration. So what you need to really have a strong belief in uh, or think about is, is the aspiration. So what you want to be you know, as your career progress. I mean, there is no right, as I believe, there is no right, wrong, or, you know, correct uh, or, or uh, incorrect steps. But just as you think the aspiration that you, where you want to be and take your career as a journey. 
The second part is you have to take a good assessment of uh, or a reality check about the capabilities. And the capabilities is made up of three core elements. One is about the behavior. Second is about your experience. So as you move on with your career, taking up different roles in different organizations that gives you, provides you the experience. And the third is about the skills. And of course, the skills comes with our education. And then the, that, like what I mentioned about reskilling and de-skilling is about how you learn on the process of your career. And all these three together uh, added up what we call capabilities. Now, there is, I mean, it's a good time that we all actually take a good look at our capabilities and try to see where we are lacking, where we are ahead. And, and that gives you sort of a priority check. So what you can do is that next step is to do a, a kind of gap analysis in terms of setting up a development goal uh, that that will help you sort of transition into your next step in the career and that's where it comes the planning so i think what what all of us should be aware of that once you have a goal uh, a development goal you need to embrace a kind of what we need to do to achieve that goal so that comes the planning yeah. And then once you have that plan, what I learned from my uh, from, from uh, the Unilever HR uh, experience uh, that we had in uh, I mean, opportunity to interact, that it's always good to have this plan, you know, alive, a living document uh, all through the year and try to assess in your small steps, whatever you do, you know, whether you are moving forward in the right direction or not because that will give you most probably a kind of uh, an overview uh, whether you are in right track or not. And, and there sometimes, I mean, you know, all of us have like a sort of slipped into a wrong track, but that's not a problem because if you have that goal, if you have that uh, a kind of, you know, inspiration, then it will take you track back into, into the right one. So it's always uh, important to identify the purpose and select the demand space because you know as the as i said the world is changing there are certain elements on where the demand will be more now if your core capabilities if your experience if your aspiration can match the demand it will be much easy to find the career progression if not there are ways you know it's it's always individual choice and another thing is about future fields because if you can understand that how the future is moving in your own field. I mean, I can tell you about the food, but in your own field, then most probably you also can actually plan the reskilling and, and de skilling part. Now, in terms of the last part is about the food, where I am, uh, my interest is. I mean, there are few things which is sort of, I would say, future fit uh, in terms of understanding how to produce things resource efficiently, how to process things in a carbon neutral way, how to produce uh, you know, the products uh, in, in a climate smart way. And all these actually requires a multidisciplinary approach, uh, you know, different skills, different uh, subject area core experience. And that's the beauty of food. I mean, you know, you need a biochemist, you need a marketeer, you need a chemist, you know, you need a behavioral experts, etc. So I would say that um, please concentrate, um, as other um, um, speakers say, about the network, about the collaboration, about uh, about the reaching out to people, and and try to see where you fit within this future fit landscape of your own areas. Thank you very much. All right. I really liked your aspiration cycle and how it went from the beginning to the end. I think that's perfect for thinking about careers. So Thank you. what we're going to do now is go on to the questions. <clears throat> and don't forget, if you have a question, put it in the question box. Um, let us know who the question's for, and then we'll be able to ask those questions. While we're waiting for some questions, I'm going to ask the, the, the panel each to address one particular question 
and that is it's pretty important for researchers to have their own USP, something that makes them stand out from, from their fellow postdoc, for example. So Robbie, we'll start with you. What, what is it do you think that makes you stand out? What's your USP? What's, what have you aspired to do or, or, or aim to achieve? I suppose it's it, partly what I would aim to achieve, but also what I would look for if, in a, if I was in that position of saying, uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the postdoc I want to be. Um, and that would be someone who's willing to celebrate other people's uh, successes as much as their own. Um, so, you know, academia sort of leads us down this path of we have to, to celebrate, um, you know, what we've done, make it known and, and communicate that. And I think it, we have to realise that it's not down to the individual, but it's down to people who are willing to recognise or even, um, you know, share their expertise in evaluating other people's science and sharing that information as well. And I certainly think that would be a way to uh, demonstrate that, that, you know, as a, as a postdoc or um, you know, a research fellow that you are engaged with the community and, and that you're you're looking beyond your own field almost. Great. Helen, have you got any thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, um, I guess for me, what I was able to do through um, roles in the Biochemical Society was demonstrate leadership and education from quite an early career stage. So during my postdoc and even during my PhD I was involved. Um, so I guess for me, that kind of national level education involvement, being involved with conferences, training events, also the kind of policy consultations that we've been very involved in over the years about, it, about education policy, school education and beyond. Um, I think for me it's given me, it's given me that kind of leadership, but it's also given me a really, really good kind of um, perspective on education because it means I've, I've kind of been involved with lots of different people from different universities, but also education policymakers, school educators. So I, I, it's really helped me kind of see what we do in HE and the kind of in the bigger picture, really. So I think for me, that's kind of what I've been developing over the years. OK, and Parag? Yeah, uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, it's a good to have a balance between the core expertise, the core view uh, where somebody is developing with an extended or large, you know, oversight and overview of what you can do with your skills, because that will enable you to also open up the doors of new opportunities. I mean, I can give one example very quickly. Um, you know, typically when uh, you, if you have a protein biochemist, you know, things uh, in, from that kind of training, it's always quite natural to move into the area of pharmaceuticals, biomedicine and things. However, as you see now, all these plant protein based food, etc. I mean, this is also a broader horizon of a protein biochemist can also contribute to the food and other areas. So it's a kind of little bit think ahead or I think broader. I think will help you. Thanks, great. So um, I think Helen brought up the word leadership and, and everybody talked about skills. And I think personally, I think that's really important. I think often early career researchers don't see themselves as leaders. And I think getting into the mindset where you can be a leader really quite early on in your career is, is important. And, and to consider your skills outside of your, your bench skills, really. So um, have any of you got any ideas for the audience about how best to develop leadership skills? Helen, do you want to address that? Thanks, yeah. Um, so I guess I guess things you can do, as I say, as a postdoc is you can you can mentor junior postdocs, you can mentor PhD students. So that's kind of like the obvious example in in a lab environment, for example. But I guess you know you can always you can always branch out with with a postdoc, although you are to some extent chained to your bench and need to publish. You still have you still have the ability to say run a seminar series or do some teaching or do some science outreach. So you can sort of spend a little bit of time developing those skills outside of the lab as well. And I think that can help you kind of get experience and skills that can lead to other things. Yeah, and Parag, uh, maybe address uh, an aspect of that question to you. 
Um, in terms of ECR, early career researchers moving forward, some kind of appreciation of management and business, even in academia, could be helpful. What's your thought on that? Absolutely, Sela. I mean, I mean that that's really important. I think uh, that you know, typically we concentrate much on our kind of scientific skills, the core skills, what do we say? However, it's also important to emphasize, particularly for leadership, is about the soft skills. You know, how to work with others, how we communicate, you know, properly. I mean, these are ever important when uh, all the uh, the challenges are becoming complex. So there is not one person, but you know, many persons join together to solve something. And that's really, and managing expectations, because as a leader, if you know how to manage expectations, I think then it's always making you a step ahead. And one of the aspects I would like to add here is about um, in the UK, there is a program called Future Leader Program. And um, that was really, really fantastic, I think, uh, for many of the ECRs and, and all of the ECRs, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are opportunities out there for people to, to get on these leadership courses and they can only help. So, Robbie, maybe to go to you next, you talk quite a bit about the use of social media in your presentation, which, which obviously is pretty important these days. Um, and in terms of impact, what's your view on social media and impact in terms of early career researchers' careers? I, I think it's becoming more and more important, certainly. So from my own perspective, obviously I started off using Twitter. I'm, I'm quite a recently come along to, the, to sort of join Twitter and uh, I initially thought that, oh, it's just a platform to, to share what you've done. Um, but I'm quickly realizing actually it, it, it goes a lot deeper than that. There are opportunities to um, firstly share, share your expertise, but also to kind of translate that science as well um, in terms of the scientific communication, um, developing a broader audience for your science, you know, in terms of uh, then reaching reaching more people. The other thing that I found uh, particularly encouraging is the fact that the community is very willing to help. Um, from my uh, PhD experience, the, the, the greatest asset that I, I had were, were supportive um, mentors and other postdocs in other labs who were willing to help me along the way and offer advice. Um, Twitter essentially gives you that opportunity to get that expertise in there from a much broader array of scientists. And that's something I think is really unique. Great. And so we have a question from the audience for you as well, Robbie. It's from Vijay Latha and um, they ask, I had a long career break and I'm currently unemployed. Is it possible to get volunteer opportunities in STEM publishing? Uh, I don't know if you know about that, but what do you think? That's a very interesting question. I, I, to be honest, I don't know that I'm, I'm the right person to ask, but I certainly think if you're interested in publishing, speak to some of those publishers, engage with them on social media and just put it out there that you'd be interested to kind of get a little bit more experience. The um, It was quite recently Portland Press put out a, sort of a, uh, an advert to bring in sort of guest editors. Now, I'm not sure quite what the, the restrictions were on that role, they're certainly looking for people to contribute in that way and uh, you know it was it, it's worth asking the question and what do you think about blogging as an activity to to get started in that kind of career definitely i think it, it's a fantastic opportunity the best thing you can do if if you maybe if you've been out of academia for a few years and your publication record you know it, your personal research profile might not be as up to date share your experience experience and your expertise in evaluating others other sites you know we don't have enough people who are willing to shout about some of the really interesting and fascinating stories and in fact i find myself more and more going to social media to actually find which papers are, are very interesting to read because they've, they've, they've generated sort of a, a, a bit of a buzz about them you know and there are people willing to say well actually this has implications far beyond you know potentially the the sort of narrow field that it might originally be of interest to so yeah definitely definitely something to, to participate with great okay thanks for that so maybe we'll go to helen for the next question um, and this is from the the audience so michelle asks how do you make or find time to do all of these extra things when so much of academia is just about keeping your head above water with the tasks you have to do that's a great question yeah that's a really good question and yeah it, i think especially in the last year since covid it's been really hard 
to find the time. I think it's about um, it's about being organised about the stuff you absolutely have to do. Um, so to, to keep our jobs ticking over, to keep the students happy, to keep our bosses happy and, and the university happy, we have to do those things. But I think you can be um, flexible about like when you do this extra stuff. So if you're writing something extra, so for example, something like a blog that Robert was just talking about, or you want to write an application to say join one of the biochem panels or uh, committees, save save that job for when you've got your best energy. So don't do it at five o'clock when you spent the whole day answering emails from students. Do it eight o'clock in the morning, get it done, and then you can go through the, the motions. And I think I, I've realized quite recently that managing time is one thing, but managing your own energy is another thing. Managing when you work best, and then you can get things done in a, in a kind of, in an effective way. But it is really difficult. The other thing I would say is, this is kind of what I was trying to articulate in my talk, I think, about um, tying in your external stuff with your internal stuff. So it's not like you're doing something at your university and something completely different outside. It's like you're doing similar things, but at different levels. So some of the resources you can, you may write for your university, you can use outside as well, or some of the, the networks you have overlap. So I think it's about being a bit, a bit wise about making sure those things overlap but but yeah I appreciate it. it's it's very difficult to fit things in and I think this year has been especially difficult. I would follow up from that with ask your boss or if if your boss isn't such a person you could ask ask your mentor if you don't have a mentor get one and um, it's quite possible that that your particular situation whether it be industry or academia or or whatever um, may have certain criteria for promotion that your boss will want you to hit but some of them might actually cover some of the things we're talking about for example public engagement and, and impact and outreach so um, I think that's that's important to do so inform yourself in your local environment as well as going out and contacting others other areas like societies so um, maybe go to Parag next uh, there's a question from Michael Going back a few years in time, what would you recommend to a finishing PhD student who's simply at the very beginning of their career in terms of networking, etc.? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think, well, um, actually now uh, the networking, because of the electronic media, the social uh, enterprise and, and, and also the social media, I think the networking like LinkedIn and others, I mean, has become very, very handy yeah, compared to even 10 years back. So in that way, exploit those avenues, yeah, which were not there a few years back. And the second thing, uh, well, another thing is about the social media, be active there, which will give you, you never know how the opportunities will open up. And in order to do that, I think it's also good to understand that where where is your interest, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, if we think of the behavioral skills, um, I tell you from my own experience, it's always good to have a purpose workshop because that will give you an enlightenment about what is your purpose, what, what you want to do, where you get your energy uh, in terms of the career, and also that serves very good with your work-life balance uh, very early on. I mean, you know, among us, some of us are creative, uh, people, some of our, our problem solvers, you know, so you need to know who you are, because then you can think of, there are so many networking opportunities, you never, you don't want to go everywhere, but you know, you tailor those space by understanding where your interest is, which makes you, you know, interested. Great. And the, the next question from the audience is from Noor. And it's a fairly, fairly general question that, that I can answer and maybe everybody else might want to, to feed in. Um, I am a student, of, a student of Bachelor in Biochemistry. Which course is best after completing my degree? Well, that's a really difficult question to actually answer directly. And, and from my point of view, what you should do looking forward is look to see what excites you. Don't ever do anything that you don't find exciting. So if you don't, if you want to do a master's course next, find the master's course that you find the most exciting. If you want to do a PhD, don't ever do a PhD on something that you think, oh God, I'm not so sure about this. You've got to really, really passionately want to do it. 
and and that excitement and passion will ca carry you through any career. Robbie, do you want to feed back on that? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't contradict that at all. And in fact, if you weren't sure if a particular area was, you know, truly where your passion lies, I, I think there's absolutely no harm in asking um, or reaching out to people who work in that industry just for, say, for example, an informational interview. You just you just say, can we go for a chat and a coffee and can I find out a little bit more about your role? And you never know, you might find that that leads to another opportunity down the line to either, you know, could be volunteer work, could be an internship, but it just gives you that um, opportunity to gain some certainty about where you want to be and what you want to do. Helen, have you got any advice on uh, in that situation? Yeah, I, I, t I agree with what's been said. Like doing a PhD is hard, and if it's something you find boring or uninteresting, it's going to be way harder because <laughs> you have to do, you know, you have to go through a lot of stuff. But I think, yeah, I think what Robbie said, you know, it's really okay to ask questions if you these kinds of decisions, you know, taking on a PhD, for example, it's, it's a fairly big decision, and don't just sort of think, yeah, I think it's probably okay, I'll go for it. Talk to the super academics love talking about their research. Talk to the supervisor, they'll tell you loads, they'll find out loads. You can share ideas. It may be that you have ideas for the project that you can share with them. And you know, all these conversations can only really be positive. Um and, and I think do do keep a half an eye out to, to where it can lead as well. So, you know, if you're thinking about going into a particular thing at some point, what kind of skills can you pick up during that training? You know what kind of place is it can you get involved with the various things you want to be involved with so keeping half an eye out on those kinds of things as well and parag if maybe if we go to you um if newer was thinking of entering industry after a degree in biochemistry what would you advise in terms of what next how would an early career researcher plan to transition from academia into industry I think the, the first and foremost thing is to go for apprenticeship, you know, uh, in, in the in the end part of your study. I think it always helps. I have seen people in Unilever uh, from different universities across Europe and UK, uh, where actually people after that either went back to the university and went move into the career in academia or joined in another in, in industry. So I think that will give you a kind of uh, an insight about okay do you like these kind of jobs you know which is typical of an industrial setting uh, and and if you actually decide to go for industry industry i think you are it's always good to have like roby said i mean discuss like with academia also discuss some of your friends or you know your seniors who are in the industry through social network and and try to understand that actually that meets your expectations Great. And so for, for every member of the panel, um, what about if we sum up, what would we what, what would you, you give as your your number one or number one and two key pieces of advice? Maybe we start with Parag again. Thanks, Ella. Yeah, I mean, I would say that please, if I mean, there are a lot of uh, opportunities in terms of do a purpose workshop. You know, this purpose workshop is is fantastic because that will open up your eyes in terms of what you can do what you are good at how does fit your interest and excitement uh, i would say that's number one and second thing is that be flexible you know this world is changing and there is no hard and fast you know demarcation about you know industry academia this demarcation is getting blurred so i would say be flexible i mean these are the two uh, suggestions i would give helen yeah, um, I guess my tips would be um, like this. This relates back to the question about how to find time, like make time, save time. This is the important stuff. Whether you respond to that email today or tomorrow generally doesn't matter. But this is the stuff that really matters. And this is the stuff that actually, when I think about what I do, really makes me enjoy my job. Um, and, and I think also just sort of make sure and this is something that's really difficult to do, but make sure people know what you're doing. People internally know that you're organising a conference externally. And like Robbie said, you know, shout about your own work, but also shout about other people's work. Where you see good things happening, just, just sort of spread the word. And I think that leads to a, a much more sort of collegiate atmosphere in, in academia and I guess in industry as well. So, 
yeah I'd say really really make time for this sort of stuff because it's it's what you'll enjoy I think and finally Robbie definitely I, I, I agree with all of those and I think one thing to to state is know your audience know who you're speaking to and who you want to be speaking to when you when you put put yourself out there the second thing I'd say is have a little bit of information that that tells them you know tells people who you are if they're interested in learning more about you and, and you've you've contributed something positive you know have have those pages the the for example could be LinkedIn just to you know so people know who who you are and who to attribute it to great and and also keep your CV updated don't let anything go unwritten write everything down just so you have a record of it everything is important okay we're going to wrap up now and I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and I'd like to particularly thank the speakers for some uh, very illuminating presentations I think we've covered a lot of some a lot of very interesting aspects of, of early careers and, and what you can do to raise your profile um, you can continue the conversation online by uh, following uh, Biochemical Society and Portland Press Publishing on Twitter more information about careers and about your building your career profile and job seeking advice can be found on our website. You can also find some day in the life guides, career profiles on the biochemist webpage, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers um, to focus in this biochemistry focus webinar series. And if you have a good idea for a, for a webinar, then we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar, great way to start raising your profile. And you can find more in information about these webinars um, on the website shown below. So please join us for our next webinar in the series, which is entitled An Experimental Map of the Degradable Kinome, a resource for ex expedited degraded development. And that's on the 10th of June at 1600 hours, four o'clock in the afternoon. And it's going to be chaired by Dr. Elton Zakir Ash, who's a Henry Dale Fellow and University Academic Fellow from the University of Leeds. And we have an invited speaker, Dr. Fleur Ferguson, who is the William A. Lee Assistant Professor, University of California, San Diego. And they're going to talk about large scale chemical exploration of key variables for targeted protein degradation across the kinome. Um, that was undertaken to develop a global map of kinase degra degradatability, if that's right, I'm not sure it is. Finally, I'd like to highlight that in these challenging times, it's more than important than ever to stay connected and engaged with your fellow molecular bioscientists. It's an extraordinarily and, and often worrying time for us all, but it's op often an exciting, it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society. We have a large community of researchers and specialists who do stay connected and we have lots of benefits for membership, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings and exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries and personal online access to two of, the, two of our journals and much more. So please visit our website for more information. Finally, I'd like to say thanks to everybody and goodbye and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye, everyone.